Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Where is God in all of this? Let's face it, for those of us who trust that somewhere above us, beyond us, among us, and within us, that there is this divine loving force that is the source of all that is. This is the question that when we are afraid and confused and suffering and grieving, this is the question that haunts us. And at times such as these, it becomes this incredibly urgent question, where is God in all of this? When forces beyond our control, a virus that has taken nearly 400,000 lives worldwide, over 111,000 of them here in the United States, shows no sign of slowing, and the pain and the rage of the many among us who have suffered oppression and injustice is erupting in our streets and public spaces, smiting our consciences, breaking our hearts, and calling us to a level of individual and collective repentance and resolve to restore and reconcile and heal that we may wonder if we are even capable of. Where is God in all of this? Well, it seems a bit ironic that here you and I are asking that question on the one feast day of the church year that is not about where God has been at pivotal moments in that sweeping drama of life and death, brokenness and redemption, despair and hope that is the Christian story, like Christmas, or Good Friday, Easter. But rather today, we are celebrating a doctrine about who God is that was hammered out over 1,600 years ago. After decades of fighting over words like homoousius and whether or not the Holy Spirit proceeded just from the Father or from the Father and the Son. On this Trinity Sunday in the year of our Lord 2020, how can an arcane theological invention possibly speak to this moment? How can it tell us where God is? Well, I've been struggling with that question all week. And then finally, I was reminded of what started the whole thing. That debate that led to fierce arguments and allegations of heresy and numerous councils, and finally to that carefully crafted doctrinal statement signed off on in Constantinople in the year 381 that you and I know as the Nicene Creed. It began with deeply faithful people trying to figure out how to make sense of and incorporate what they were now experiencing of God into what they thought they already knew. The first Christ followers were determined monotheists, faithful Jews, whose creed was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One living God who created all that is, who sees, loves, guides, judges, punishes, and redeems, who calls people into covenantal relationship, accompanies them in the wilderness, and expects them to obey holy laws. Yet in Jesus of Nazareth, these early Christians met one in whom they were convinced God had come so near that God was actually incarnate incarnate in this teacher, this healer, this prophet, this self-proclaimed son of man who announced that the reign of God was already here and they were invited into it. And then, after his death and their experience of him as alive again and his subsequent departure, 
the Spirit of God that Jesus had promised would be coming to them arrived. This breath of God, this wind of God, filling them and empowering them and transforming them and binding them together into this community that was itself a living body, a body where God's presence and healing were being manifest in new and dramatic ways. And they knew that it was the same God in all those places, up there and down here and everywhere. And 1,600 years ago, in that context, in that thought world, which by now had expanded to include the Greeks, the only way that they could make sense of that lived experience was to imagine this one God in three persons and construct the doctrine of the Trinity to explain it. A doctrine that talked about shared substance and relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You and I, in our 21st century thought world, receive this ancient work with, I suspect, both appreciation and some puzzlement. Astronomers and physicists now estimate that the cosmos is something like 13.75 billion years old. The gorgeous creation hymn in Genesis that Will read could seem like far cry from an eons long chaotic process of emergence and collapse and evolution that scientists are convinced is ongoing. These days, women and men find images of an anthropomorphic male deity and patriarchal structures of authority and social order offensively limiting and incongruent with their lived experiences of a God who inhabits and affirms all life and all love, God who is the very ground of all being. That's from the brilliant 20th, 20th century theologian Paul Tillich. And as you and I find our journeys of questioning and faith and doubt and hope enriched by those of so many other seekers across time and traditions, we are coming to recognize that all of our construals of who God is are provisional. They are oh so limited glimpses of a mystery, the edges of which we can barely perceive. The older we have gotten, the less we are realizing we actually know. And yet, does not this notion of a divine reality that we may encounter in the ongoing dynamic of creation, in that reality's relationship of love and solidarity with us that Jesus of Nazareth incarnated, and in the living breath in us and among us that unites us with that reality and saturates all that is, can that not actually speak powerfully to where God is in this moment? We are in the midst of tremendous upheaval. Out of death, the death of individuals and the death of ways of relating to difference among us, a new creation is struggling to emerge. Oh, and by the way, 99.5% of the DNA of all human beings is the same. A new creation is struggling to emerge in our consciousness, in our institutions, and in our world. What has seemed to work in the past no longer does. What we thought we could control, we clearly don't. What needs to come into being a more just society where all are respected and protected and loved is not coming easily. Like all births, it is painful and messy and scary and hard. I imagine that the eruption of dry land out of the sea might actually have been something like that. And where is God? Well, God is in the midst of the chaos, 
creating the possibility of growth and newness in that emerging landscape. We are witnessing thousands of people all over the world expressing with their voices and their bodies their solidarity with the suffering of victims of racism, injustice, and hatred. They are risking their own safety so that all members of the human family may flourish. And where is God in this? The one we call Savior and Lord said, when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. I can also imagine him saying, when I was oppressed, you stood up for me. And when I was wrongfully killed, you suffered with me. Where is God in all of this? God is where police officers and protesters take a knee together. God is where doctors carry signs saying, you stayed home for me, now I'll kneel for you. God is in the crowds of people of all ages and races and ethnicities, recognizing the divine in one another, honoring one another, caring for one another, loving one another. And finally, my sisters and brothers, you and I are being called to hope and to work for social transformation. In these challenging and frightening times, the divine wind is blowing. The holy breath that moves in us and through us and in all the spaces among us and between us is reminding us of how inextricably we are connected with one another and with all of creation and empowering us to manifest our vocation as bearers of that life-giving love that is the ground of our being. Where is God in all of this? Well, Jesus' last words were, I am with you always. God is right here, right now. God is with you and in you and in me. No matter how confused and afraid and overwhelmed and whatever we may be, God is with us. God is at work in us. God is accompanying us. God is renewing and transforming us right here. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.